The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur Magazines. Expressive landscape painting with palette knife in plein air. That's what this video is with Cynthia Rosen. Hi, I'm Cynthia Rosen. I'm going to do a plein air demonstration that is outdoor painting. I'm here at Longhorn River Ranch just outside of Austin, Texas. It's a beautiful day. As with most plein air painting, you have to be totally prepared in terms of your own equipment and be aware of what's happening with the weather. When I first came out and set up, it was beautiful and sunny. I had lots of shadows. They're back now. I keep getting cloud cover, so I'll just keep using my memory to hold on to certain details about the site. The main thing, before you start, have all of your gear ready. So this is the hat I usually wear, painting plein air. Keeps the back of my neck cool, away from the sun. Since I'm standing in the shade of the tree today, I'm just gonna wear a cap. I usually carry a bandana. It's great, I can dip it in water, cool myself off, wrap it around my neck if I'm standing in the sun and I have a long sleeve shirt on over a lightweight shirt just to help to keep the sun off of me. Um, going to put my cap on and talk a little bit about how I paint quite differently than most plein air painters. A uh, lot of more classically trained or traditional plein air painters that are painting the scene that they see. Uh, they may start with a sketch. Okay, trees, uh, here's a tree here. The river behind, uh, weaving through the painting. And then it may either that piece or something else turn into what's referred to as a no tan where they're blocking in their darks and their lights. Right now the river is quite dark. There's shadow from the tree. This can become a black and white. They can add a third value in if they want. It's referred to as a no tan. It's not how I paint. I'm a palette knife painter. I approach my paintings from a very different direction. My interest is not only the dynamics of the landscape, but pushing those dynamics and color. I love the impressionists, the expressionists, and the color field painters. I like to use Gamblin paints. I always start by staining my board. And I use a red-orange color. This will be the only time when I stain my board and I do the layout that I use a brush. If I'm doing portraits, occasionally I'll throw some brush into it.
While I'm doing this, I just want to throw a shout out to the Longhorn River Ranch owners for letting me come paint here. It's exquisite property. Okay, I tend to use whatever extra paint I have on my palette for the base color, which is in the red-orange chroma, you know, the hues. I like the excitement that it gives. I allow some of that color to show through. I always stain my board on site. It allows me a few minutes to absorb my surroundings. That's just important for my head to become familiar, to feel the air, to see the colors. I get to hear the birds at times. So I always stain my board on site. Can you do it beforehand? Sure. But for me, it gives me time. Do I ever vary from the orange and red? Sometimes. You know, sometimes I'll throw some purple in. It depends on the scene. If I'm in a totally wooded area, Maybe I'll throw some uh, Lizarin Permanent in, or even purple. Now my palette always starts out with a Prussian blue. I'm basically out of the Prussian blue on my palette, so I'm going to add some more now. And I forgot I'm going to put on my gloves. These are fabulous art gloves. They're actually called great art gloves, and they are. You can paint with them 10 times over, throw them in the washing machine, and reuse them. I feel better using these. I've used the nitrile gloves, which are great and handy. But these don't make as much trash on the earth. Actually, old undershirts, men's undershirts, are fabulous for rags because they can loop right around and then you just keep rotating it. So I will mention a few other tools that I have with me. I rarely use them, but they're handy and I want to introduce them to you. This is fabulous. It's a composition finder. What it allows you to do is say, okay, these are the proportions of my canvas. This is the scene I'm looking at. Where do I find a good composition? You can change the proportions any which way you want. It's a fabulous tool. On the side, this other is a helpful tool here. It shows a value guide. So if you're not sure if you're looking at something light or dark, if it's like the green, what value is it? Is it light, green? How dark is it relative to everything else around? It's a handy tool. If you're a new painter, pick yourself up a color wheel. Uh, it's a really, really handy tool for understanding color. I don't think anything's better than actually using color, but it's a handy tool to study. And this is a tool a lot of plein air painters use. Actually, it works in the studio, not for me. We all see things a little differently. We understand things differently. We learn differently. But what this does is it helps isolate the lights from the darks. So it helps you understand the value of what you're seeing. That is the scale of light and dark. What is mid-tone here? What is super dark? What is really light? It's a helpful tool, more useful in plein air. For me. Now I'm going to get to work and talk about composition a little bit. The only time I use the Galkid Gamsol mix 
is with the base coat. And I'm going to grab some to sketch in. So you can see what I'm talking about when I talk about the dynamics of the composition. So the first thing is I like the diagonal of the hill over there. And then there's a hill coming across here. So I've got this kind of composition. I have trees. I chose to stand under the trees because they're going to help frame. We read left to right. And so in my mind, your viewer is going to come in on the left side of your page. The corners, basically, I don't pay much attention to. If you have a great center of interest in your corner, your viewer can be stuck there. We don't want that. You want your viewer to come in and move around your canvas. So I quickly sketched in. You can already see the dynamics at work. This is my painting. It's my creation. The real thing is out there. If I wanted to make it more lyrical, I would capture the curvature in that tree. But for me, I want to use the trees for excitement. So I'm going to push the angular aspect of them. So they're going to frame what some would call the center of interest. And then I'm going to break that by using the shadows caused by the trees. So I'm throwing this in. In my vocabulary, a triangle acts as a direction, an arrow. It tells you where to go. But I don't want the people to go off. I don't want the viewer, I'm sorry, to go off the page. I'm going to bring them back around. You'll see. And I will do that with the light once I get to color. So going into composition, keeping the viewer on the page. I'll make use of some of the leaves here to curve there. There are some branches coming in. The main point of why I'm here is there's this river that runs through it. So this is where I'll pick up a little bit of grace. Given the fact that my paintings are more about dynamic, they're not traditional, beautiful, they're not romantic, they're not dreamy. They're about the movement of color. But this river comes through. So I'm going to make use of it. And it actually, there's a road that comes across it, comes up into the hills. I'll make use of that as well, part of my composition. And there are some trees here. Learning about perspective is really important, even if you're an abstract painter. Uh, even if you're a color field painter or any, if you want to make use of what you're seeing as your jumping off point, which is what I do. This is my inspiration. My painting is not specifically going to look like this site. This is a jumping off point for me to play with the colors here and for an image. So. Referring to perspective, there is a cute little building way off to the side over there. When I came in, the light on it was fabulous. Do I want to put it into the painting? I'm not sure. If so, I would pull it in here. As I've said, this is your painting. It's your creation. Be brave. Enjoy what you're doing. Find out what about a scene when you're outside sparks your interest, that's what you paint. I have a tiny little board here, which I could stain orange, but you know, I was thinking maybe I'll use it for a demo. Maybe I will do a really quick little study, but I think I'm going to dive right in. Do I want to put this building in? Do I want to have it on the page, off the page? I'll see what happens with the light as the day goes on. I know what I saw when I first came was a bit of a misty feel along here. Well, all that mist has risen, but I may 
pull it back into the painting. There are several ways to create a sense of distance. The kind of painting I do has more, it's more about color moving off the page, across the page. I'll explain through the course of the painting where that interest comes from. But I may use the sense that this was a little hazier to just help push it back as the painting progresses. So these are my notes to myself composition-wise. Now I'm just going to go paint. You can see the angle on the neck. I don't have to worry as much about getting my fingers in the paint when I move the paint around. Here's a smaller version. You can see the triangulated head. These are the ones I like. They're not so wide that they hold a lot of paint. I get some fabulous edges. I'll talk about edges and how they impact your painting as we progress. I got a little sidetracked. Back to my colors. Prussian blue, purple dioxazine, alizarin permanent. It's more permanent over the course of time than alizarin crimson, which tends to brown over time. Cad red medium, cad orange, cad yellow medium, and either a Hansa light or a cad light, and then I use cobalt blue. That's my normal palette. There's Portland Gray. Gamblin makes a gray called Portland Gray, which is just a really pretty, very handy gray. They have Portland Gray Light. They have Portland Gray Deep. Various shades. It's handy. I brought it with me. And because there are so many greens around, whether it's a phthalo blue or a cobalt teal, these are great colors. Uh, Cerulean, I find a little dark. It has more gray in it than what I like, so I tend not to carry a cerulean. But any of the turquoise colors, as long as it's not a deep color, they make amazing greens. I don't carry green paint. I don't carry brown paint. I don't carry black paint. On my Facebook page, in fact, there's two paintings I recently posted. One with a limited cat palette of just cobalt blue, cad red medium, cad yellow medium, and white. And another, they're both demo paintings, another painting I did with the full palette, the Prussian blue, cobalt blue, purple dioxazine, alizarin, cad red, cad orange, cad yellow, and white. And I posted just to see who could tell which painting had the limited palette. Basically, no one could tell. You know, a few people got it right. Maybe there were 100, 150 responses. You can't really tell the difference. You don't need to carry much paint. I've actually left my house one day leaving the backpack with my good paints home and I had these leftover odd colors that I had adopted from my kids, whatever, never use, brought the wrong backpack with me. As long as you have warm and cool colors, your painting's going to work. So don't sweat it. So I use two whites. I use a titanium white for my really, really strong, bright whites. So I'm going to put some titanium out. These colors here were left over from yesterday. I'm not going to use them today. I'm going to move them over because this is where I usually put my zinc white. I will just use them for mixing. Another side note, there is such a thing called a tube ringer. They're fabulous. I get the, I suggest getting the metal one. As we know, plastic things tend to break over time. They weaken. So I'm going to put my zinc white over here on the side. This is the white I'm going to use for most, most of the painting, unless I want something really bright. And I wish I had my tube ringer with me, but that's back in Vermont. 
I had to limit what I carry in my suitcase for traveling. I usually wear hiking boots. Insulated hiking boots. Keeps you warm when it's cold out, keeps you cool when it's really hot, and it provides great arch support. So hiking boots are fabulous, but a little tough to take in a suitcase. So I'm gonna attack the painting. So I'm going to uh, throw in some of my darks. You will see that as I paint, I tend to allow a lot of the orange to show through. like how this tree comes down into where the river is or the creek. I am moving all over the page. I will keep moving all over the page. Unlike a more traditional painter, actually I will make use of this now for a moment, if there's a tree shape, a traditional painter would block that whole tree in. Say, so, okay, here are my darks. I'm just going to use some of this leftover paint to show you. I see there's some light hitting this. That doesn't help. There are the midtones. This would be a more traditional approach. I'm going to throw some of that turquoise into that orange mix to make more of a green color. Okay, that would be a more traditional approach. I'll put that right there so you can see it better. Okay, simple shapes, they wouldn't use such thick paint. Uh, this it will be basically a throwaway. I like orange, I don't like white. I'm going to cover that up, not worry too much about it. Throw a little blue, actually here's some light blue here left over from yesterday. It's too dark. Okay. But just blocking in colors. Uh, the sky on a much more traditional painting would be really light. My sky will get light. But you can see how you could build colors, a landscape quite quickly. So I took note of where the sun was. It's important to know where it's going to end up. I'm painting pretty much when the sun overhead. It's not ideal. The best time to go out to paint plein air is early in the day or late in the day. Your colors are exquisite then. Everything tends to flatten out midday. The only thing is if you're a beginner painter, go more towards the middle of the day because your light will stay consistent for a longer period of time. Early morning, late afternoon, you may have 10 minutes of consistent light, if that. As the sun rises, then the time will stretch out. But for a new painter, go midday. Okay, so I'm gonna, I just need to get some color on here. My base coat 
on my painting is not going to be that important. It's really just to get paint on the surface. I need paint down. I've got some darks. I'm going to throw some lights. Ideally, you want your canvas to be parallel to your face. Okay, so this is where the fun begins. mixing paint. So I'm going to look for that blue color while I'm putting it down. I'm going to look for it wherever I can find it. No, it's not here. But as I said, this is a base coat. And I'm going to let that color, it's going to follow. Actually, I'll throw a little bit here. I'll figure out if I want to put the building in. My reader, my viewers coming in left to right, I want them to move here, 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 back again. So they keep going into the painting. I don't have a specific center of interest. A uh, lot of more traditional painters do. My interest is how the color moves around. It comes from when I was much younger and I was making art, and actually in college. But I was, dry, I was working full time and I would drive 50 minutes to work each day. So I'm thinking about my art but I'm seeing the world move by me constantly. I'm sure that's where my interest in the movement came from because then my art, which had been very traditional before that, moved into the more non-objective field and it would be spray paint, it would be pastel, and I had little color calligraphic kind of symbols moving across the page and that had to do with motion. So our environment affects us subtly or in a big way. And just like they always tell you when you were learning to write, to write what you know, paint what you're familiar with, especially when you start. You know, I will go places and paint things that I don't know specifically in order to learn. So I'm going to use this color. As I said, I'm going to make these colors, mix them up. They don't work for this day, this painting. This is a Joshua Bean palette. I, this is my own easel. This is a prototype. I'm sort of working it through. Um, I love the Coulter box, how it sets on it for travel. The bean palette, it weighs ounces, so it's fabulous. It's small enough to go into a backpack to go right on the plane so you don't worry about losing it if the baggage gets lost. Okay, so I'm going to bring the greens in. But anyway, when I first started making art, that is after high school. High school, I painted a lot. Very traditional. You learn to walk before you can run. And uh, decided my first year in college, I just wanted to draw. I wanted to learn the colors of black and white, understand how to draw. 
Okay, so I know that outdoors, this light's constantly changing and I'm constantly looking. There's some purple now in that hillside. Do I want to pick it up and put it in? In fact, this whole ridge now, the way the light's hitting it, um, the, a lot of the brown in the earth is coming through and it's reading as a purple color. I will keep that in mind. I like that color. It will work well. In fact, right now, there's a lot of orange coming in here. So, you know, the more you get used to painting, it's a matter of miles. I talk about plateaus. We, su we study something, we learn it. We find out what works and doesn't. And every time we go to learn something new, it's an uphill climb. Then we hit this plateau where we practice what we've learned until it's integrated and then we're ready to go back up. Whether it's a plateau, whether it's climbing a ladder, the amount of time you put in is going to pay off. So I'm going to throw myself, I got, I'm building up paint on my palette. Would it be quicker with a brush? Yes. But I picked up a palette knife to learn about color. I realized because I had done so much uh, study in black and white, and then I went to very monochromatic kind of imagery, that when I started to paint not many, many years ago, I didn't know anything about color. And I started out with a brush and it was much more traditional. And so I picked up a knife so I could mix color and learn about it. And I just never put it down because I love it. I love mixing the color. I love to see what happens here. I can take these colors and make them any which way I want. And then apply them directly. So while I'm mixing colors, you know, I'm, I see this path here. It has this color in it. I'm going to throw it in. And I'm going to bring it back in here. Okay, so we're having some issues with the sun. So I'm going to pull out my umbrella, see if that's going to help at all. So I'm making some purple color notes to myself. And as you can see at this point, I'm just sort of uh, touching them in onto the canvas. Where else do I want them? I want them down here, down where the path goes behind the trees and on the river bank. Red. I'm warming it up a little bit. This side of the hill is going to have a lot more warmth to it. Think of the sun, think of warm. You're talking about your yellow, your orange colors. As you can see, I'm moving them about. I'm moving my knife about. This will lighten up as it goes off into the distance a bit. 
The hill behind here actually is more horizontal. This is where I'm going to get a bit of sense of gentleness is by arching those hills a bit. This is my painting. When you paint, it's your painting. Make the adjustments that you want to paint. You're painting a painting. When I teach, I say if you're painting the White House, it has to look like the White House. When you're painting a landscape, unless you're painting someone's house as a commission, feel a sense of freedom. It's there. It's in the trees. It's in the grass. Everything changes. It's in the clouds. It changes the light. Make use of it and enjoy it. Might as well. Okay. A little bit of that purple color here. Since I want to move it all over my canvas, I'll actually wipe my knife off in the sky with it just to help the painting have a greater sense of coherence when it's done. I'm not far from getting my base layer on. This is just the base layer of paint. I do want to get shadows here. It's under the trees. Those become an important composition piece. So I need to go a little bit of darker into my gray. Darker and bluer. My shadows are cool. I want a cooler color for them. And they are disappearing fast because the sun is coming ahead. Remember I talked about that triangular piece coming across. This is where I'm putting it in. There's scattered light peeking through. These purples will be the scattered light. Don't skimp when you mix paint. Make sure you have enough. I'm picking up on that triangular shape. Bringing some of that color around. There's a tree back here. There are some trees on the hill here. I'm going to pick up some of that color. It's all about moving the color around. And there are some trees up top. I want to throw them in. They're just little marks. There's a woman, an independent scholar named Ellen Disanyaki. Uh, my tendency is to call her cultural anthropologist, but she's not. Her interest was the anthropological and cultural beginnings of art and how it's evolved in our society. She talks about biobehavior, and that is if we see a horizon line or if we see a line across something, we automatically throughout all the history, we've seen that as a horizon. We automatically perceive it as a horizon. You know, if I had a chalkboard, I'd make a circle. I'd say, what is it? Some people say, it's a sun. Well, it's a ball. It's a circle. 
Yeah? If I put rays around it, if it's a sun, if I put two eyes on it, it's a face. It's a common understanding, it's a common language. If I put little dashes here along the edge of the hill, our brain's going to read them as trees. And that's a language that I use in my painting. I don't show all the details. I don't show all the texture. I show shapes, and I use shapes for my viewer to get an understanding because my interest is really the color. But her books are fabulous. If you want to read, uh, the first one of hers I read was called Homo Aestheticus, and it's a wonderful read. I mean, it's not like picking up nonfiction, but it's really interesting. Okay, so I have these trees here, those marks that were trees. Remember those? They're there. I'm going to talk about edging and how I'm going to use them. I'm going to let some of that orange exist. I have a really large painting in my studio that I've been working on for the Mountain Oyster Club exhibit, which is trees. And it's a large enough painting that I get into the texture of the trees with my knife. Here, I'm just using the dynamic shapes of the trees. You'll see how I cut them into the painting as we proceed. Okay, I'm going to pull out some more of that turquoise color. It's uh, cobalt teal. I like Gamblin paints best for a palette knife. I mean, I've tried there were some beautiful colors by a whole bunch of different manufacturers. The Gamblin paints have the consistency that works well with my knife. So, just a little note. I want to get some light. I want to get some of my lighter colors. There's a lot of green in front of me, all different shades. So here's a medium green, here's a more blue-green color. The medium green I'm going to put in here. You can see how vibrant it is. That's because of the turquoise that's in this color. You'd have the same thing if you picked up a phthalo blue. So whichever color works, get it, use it. Okay, now I'm going to start to have fun, my style. That is because I'm going to move my colors around. I have enough of my base coat of paint on my palette, I mean on my canvas. Talking of which, I paint on board. I use ampersand gesso board. I find it very easy to transport. I don't have to worry what I'm going to lead it on with canvas. I don't know how many of you use canvas, how often you put it, lean it against the corner of a sofa, something's poked into it, you then have to wash the back of it to smooth the canvas, tighten it back up. I find with uh, the travel I do, not only is the gesso board really easy, I don't worry about where I leave it, but the minute a painting dries, I take a piece of wax paper, lay it on top, put the next painting on top of it, so I can stack them neatly in my car. So this is a lighter green. It's really intense. I will soften that color down as I go. But right now, I'm going to move it around and I will start to create my tree. And if you watch, I keep twisting how I handle the knife. I am directing where I want the viewer to go based on the shapes I make with the knife.
once I get my base coat, now I'm going to put in the physical mileage. Every time I apply something, I, I want to step back, see how it's reading. It's hard to tell from a foot away. Okay, there's some really pretty light hitting that water, but it's very soft. What I would have put there a few minutes ago, I'm not. I'm not going to chase what they call chasing the light, but there are certain things that I'm going to remember and make use of. So I'm going to soften that color a bit by adding some of this light blue. Such a pretty color. I have so much fun mixing color that there are times I'll come up with a color and it's going in the painting. Whether I really see it there or not, it's going in. And I'll make it work by what I juxtapose next to it. God, that's such a pretty color. It's exciting. Now, if you recall, I talked about how soft that hillside was when I first came. And though the light has changed it, I wanted that softness, so I was going to remember it. I'm going to get some of that in. This hill to the left is far softer than the one to the right now, partly because of the way the light's hitting it. I'm seeing a lot more purple in it. I know I need to get some of the tree in here. That's going to happen. The top of this tree here is being struck by light. Now I'm still primarily using my zinc white. I don't need to be holding that. So by making these little marks, I'm moving around. The viewer is going to move around. They're going to see that color and this color come up to here and keep wrapping around. I'm going to bring them back down here with that color. Barely noticeable, but it's going to be there. For contrast, there are some really strong clouds, or bright white clouds, as opposed to gray clouds. I want some of that in. Now I can see where my lightest lights are. And I'm going to wrap that around. I'm going to let my clouds sort of dance through the painting as well. This is my titanium white. I've heard a number of people say that zinc white's unstable. I've spoken to paint manufacturers. Several different brands, as long as you use zinc for mixing. And they talk about percentages, but seriously, I've seen paintings on cardboard that are 100 years old or more on unprimed surfaces. Okay, 
so that's some of my really lights. I'm going to step back, take a look. Right now, I'm not seeing light in the water. There was at one point before, this blue is going to soften out. I'm going to pull some light across. Really, now there's a little streak of light blue there. I know there was and there will be more really light blue in the water. So I'm going to put some in and then I'll wait. I'll see what happens. If I don't find it there later on, I want it there anyway. It was there when I first came here. Since I'm not painting specific light, I'm painting for a sense of feeling and movement and joy. I'm taking some liberty with it. I'm sort of famous for sasses. It's my painting. I can do what I want. And it's definitely how I teach. It's how I feel. If you're going to paint, I mean, you want to try to enjoy it. Okay, now there's a path that comes across. I'm going to use that. Pick up some of that light blue over here on this side of the path and here. I'll put more in. In time, those are notes myself. So I want to get some of this sense of the path back into the painting. I can use the edge of the knife to scrape. In some ways, painting with a knife, you know, it's a little more difficult. It's definitely more difficult to come back the next day because the texture that the knife causes is difficult to paint into or over. But, yeah, I'm sort of smitten with it. I'm going to pick up some of that path that comes through here. And wrap it around into the painting. going to break it into that triangular shape. And run it off the page some. Talking of rags, one of these days, maybe tonight, this shirt will become a rag. It was one of my first painting shirts. So it'll be sad to say goodbye. It's sort of perfect. It's so lightweight, and yet it helps to keep the sun off of me when I'm painting. So this comes around.
Decision time, there's another path that comes in here. I'm not sure if I'm going to use it. So you'll find you're constantly making decisions as you go. I want to lighten a little bit here. Catch light on the hill. Catch some light. This color will change. The value's right. For scattered light on the grass, the color will change. But these will be what I call value notes to myself to get some light in here. So at the end of the day, you take all of your leftover colors or occasionally scrape them off your palette, move them to the side, and they can make a wonderful gray. Or you use them to dull down other colors. Anytime you add one color to another, you're dulling it down. Okay. It's a softer color. Rembrandt and Francisco Goya did it. Henry Matisse and Marc Chagall did it. Now it's your turn to give it a whirl. What is it? Creating intense movement, depth, and color variation using a palette knife. It's an incredible tool that is a must-have for every artist. Yet, many have not used the palette knife to paint directly on their canvas. And when they do, they're often surprised to see the unique interest and drama it creates in their artwork. Streamline Art Video proudly presents Expressive Landscape Painting, Palette Knife in Plain Air with Master Artist Cynthia Rosen. In this video presentation, you'll discover how your art can have a whole new look and feel by using a palette knife. And there's nobody better than Cynthia Rosen to show you the way to paint in this expressive, unique style that will produce eye-catching details in your work. Blending her masters in education with her love of creativity and painting, Cynthia has been involved with education and the arts for most of her life. She's a full-time professional artist who easily communicates her focus on expression and her passion for color. From the moment Cynthia begins her start to finish paint demonstration, you'll be excited to grab your own palette knife and follow right along. As you enjoy the movement of the paint, you'll feel a whole new sense of freedom and excitement as you take up your newfound route to seeing, understanding, and reflecting the landscape like never before. You'll truly enjoy the tools and techniques that you're going to discover in this video. So though I'm applying colors all over the place, as I do, you can see that it's very deliberate. Every step I make, it's deliberate. She shows you how to see what's important to you in the scene, rather than struggle to figure out how to do everything correctly and according to the textbooks. Hi, I'm Cynthia Rosen. Thank you for joining me today. It's a beautiful day. I know the light's going to change. There are lots of factors involved. But it's a different, non-traditional process, and I hope you take away something with you from watching it. Her approach will let you enjoy your painting time and create happy memories. Those memories will become an integral part of the end product, part of the story, part of your story. Expressive Landscape Painting, Palette Knife in Plain Air is available in both DVD and as a digital download. You'll definitely want to add this outstanding video to your resource library. You know, Cynthia Rosen has a lot of courage. I've watched her in numerous occasions painting two paintings at once and painting a giant painting outdoors with a palette knife. Lots of courage, lots to teach you. You can learn more about her video at lilyartvideo.com.
Now let's get right to the interview. Given my age and where I'm at, when somebody asked me when I started to paint, it's sort of an interesting but uh, tricky question. I painted in high school. I used to retreat to my room, I'd hide in my room and I would paint. I'd sit on my bed and I'd paint. Um, I got a free ride to college. I never painted in college. I just drew. And after my first year in college, I actually worked full time and set up art programs in halfway houses and jails and alternative schools. Did a lot of drawing and did mixed media at night on my own. Would take my portfolio, get the credits. Oddly and regretfully, it was when I left college that I wanted to paint. I wanted to learn how to paint. I look back now and say, wow, I wasted that opportunity to learn from painting instructors. But I'm pretty much a self-learner, so I decide I'm going to learn to paint. I uh, got a fellowship, a traveling fellowship from the museum in Boston and decided I would sit on an island in northern Norway where there's light 24 hours a day and I would teach myself to paint. So I took a bunch of paper, gessoed paper, and some paints and sat on the island for six weeks. Uh, came back to the States, painted traditional landscapes for a couple of years. Moved to Florida and I didn't really like the landscape so I painted clouds. But I still loved color field painting, so I would do these five foot, partly stained, partly painted images of clouds as if you're totally immersed in the cloud. Technically, I was painting, but it was a whole different kind of painting. Uh, after that, when I had children, I just decided I can't make art. Uh, there was no way I could be the kind of mother I wanted to be and have the focus for making art, so I taught. Uh, when I returned to painting, it was doing theater sets, and that's really where I learned how to paint. I painted on 30 fruit balls. So I, and that was not very long ago. Maybe I'm talking seven, eight, eight, nine years ago. So I did some murals for a couple of years and decided I would go back to making art professionally. Uh, started to paint plein air because I was living in a small apartment in Arizona, no space there. So I bought some equipment, started to go outside and discovered that I loved to paint. Came back to making art at this point, only about six years ago doing it professionally. Following your heart entails being brave, knowing that you're probably going to swim upstream depending where you live. If you're living in a more conservative area and your friends are more conservative, painters, they're going to say, well, I don't understand it. Why aren't you painting this way? So following your heart, it just means being brave. It means knowing that in certain places, certain times, you're going to swim upstream. If you love beautiful, super traditional painting, go for it. I had a beautiful, romantic painter once say to me, I'd like to paint more like you. And my response, because my painting tends to be a bit more expressionistic, some people think more abstract, my response was, but you'll lose the romance in your painting. So you make decisions, what it is you like. I love beautiful romantic paintings, but it's not one in my nature right now. It was a number of years ago 
When I first learned to paint, I was incredibly traditional. I went to the Boston Museum School. I had gotten a free ride, a fellowship to go there. And I walked in thinking that art was nothing but beautiful. Now I do bemoan the fact that in our society now, very often a pile of trash in the room can be considered art. I conceptually understand it. I don't feel it's great for society. Uh, we lose our sense of ideals. If anything is looked upon as being great art, I think art helps raise our ideals of society. But with that said, I went to the museum school I, worked into, I walked into a drawing class. I decided my first year, yeah, I explored photography and printmaking and graphic design and sculpture. I walked into a painting studio to learn how to stretch a canvas and never went back. I tried ceramics. It was wonderful in that day and age. You could walk into any studio and explore. But I decided I just wanted to draw. I wanted to learn the colors of black and white. I walked into the drawing studio and one of the drawing instructors was very traditional and that was great. We would do these long figure model poses and drawings. The other drawing studio I walked into and the instructor was making triangles on the page and a lot of motion. And I just didn't get it. I thought it was ugly. How could you take the beautiful human form and transpose it into a triangle and a square? Did not understand it. Walked out of the class really upset. But I was so upset, I decided the next day I'm going back. He was hired there because he's got something to teach. And I needed to understand it. You know, you sort of, in the process of learning art, you want to learn what you don't know. I'm sure they didn't hire, it was, the teacher's name was Bill Flynn. I'm sure he wasn't hired because he was a bad teacher. Went back in and I got it. And actually, it's partly because of him that my interest is what it is today. I totally get it. And from it, I probably learned the most important lesson, and that is the simplification of shapes. I also, I would go back to that class every day, and I would learn to draw really quickly, and I would understand it was a quicker and easier way for me to get proportions. Uh, so that's how my painting today begins. I start with simple shapes, and my interest is the dynamics of the structure. Whether it's still life, whether it's a figure, whether it's painting plein air or in the studio, my interest is the composition and the dynamics of it. And when I move color around, it's because I like how things move. Uh, I love the impressionists, I love color. I love the expressionists and their boldness. But if you want to paint in a different way, know that you have to be bold and brave. Find what your passion is and follow your heart and do what you need to do to get there. If you're taking a course and you paint differently than the instructor, let the instructor know what your interest is. Advocate for yourself. You may have chosen that instructor because they have something to teach you about color, but how they structure a painting can be totally different than how you want to structure yours. So be brave. Follow your heart. I woke up one morning wanting to let go of the traditional drawing that I had been doing for years and venture into this other world. Um, in terms of the expressive, I think that this other world sent me towards color field work, abstract constructions, 
I did mixed media. I didn't really paint. I might use stains on canvas, but then I would juxtapose them to sprayed satin. Uh, so I would do mixed media pieces, and I would do spray paint and pastel. And my work became much more abstract. When I started to paint again, or when I started to paint more traditionally, I found that some of my old interests were peeking through. Um, how it happens, I don't know. It's, it's in me. It's uh, when you learn a new language and you become familiar with it, you tend to use it. So this was a language I learned, a visual language that just became a part of me. When I drive down the road, or when I look at a beautiful still life, I see that beautiful still life the way it is. I've discovered a love of color. I grew up in a very formal and beige home, and when I moved to Vermont and raised a family, beige and brown were what I was used to. I mean, we built our house basically around ourselves. We had built the shell, and we had white walls, and we had brick, and we had brown, um, and everything was neutral. And I think when I started to paint, actually before I started to paint, I remember we needed to replace the carpet. And all of a sudden, it's like, I want color in my life. Uh, we got a colorful carpet, and I loved it. And then I had to replace the wood floor. And I replaced it with a purple floor, and I painted the walls red. So, so this has been happening over time, that all of a sudden, I've discovered the joy of color. And when it comes to my painting, it's like a bit of an explosion of color. And for me, it's like a carnival every time I go to paint. It's fun, it's new, and it's joyful. The first time I painted in Arizona, there was a chocolate festival. I had read in the paper there was going to be a chocolate festival in Glendale, Arizona, and they were coupling a plein air event with it. And I didn't know what plein air was at the time. But, ah, chocolate sounds great, and painting outside uh, sounds great. And all I did, I went to Michael's, I picked up a bunch of, a little cheap set of acrylics, I bought a folding chair, took a bottle of water and some, a canvas, and I started to paint in with acrylics and discovered that before you could get the acrylic off the palette in 90 degree heat, they dry. So my very first painting was with acrylics. Then I went and I bought four colors of oil paint I had been given a gift certificate by my sisters as a birthday gift to Jerry's Orderama. A year later, I decided I'd use it and I bought a French easel, bought some uh, brushes and a couple little canvas boards and that's when I started to paint plein air. Uh, at this point, I had had the experience with the acrylic. I had some red acrylic. I stained, actually, I stained my boards with yellow. I stained another board with blue. I stained it with red. I know I don't like working on a white surface. And out in Arizona, the yellow, it's like not having any color. The blue, which would have been my inclination back east, was too dark because the molecules of paint bounce against the surface. I was not getting enough light in my painting with a dark blue background. I loved the red. I had four tubes of blue paint, 
a tube of white, a tube of transparent orange, and a tube of alizarin crimson. And that's what I had bought from my oil paints. And I went out, and those were the colors I started with. I found some other people that painted plein air. I joined some plein air Facebook sites. I learned a lot about color. Picked up the palette knife because my paintings were more staid and traditional than what I wanted. I wanted greater freedom. I wanted to learn about color more. And that's the beginning of the end. That's why I'm where I am today. It's all because of painting in Arizona that I needed the oil paints because everything else dried so quickly. Um, occasionally, I will paint with watercolor. I love watercolor. Uh, I don't travel with it. I don't like doing plein air events with it because I won't carry glass. I did that back when I was doing mixed media. Most of my work was framed under glass because it had pastel. And I like pastel, but I'm in love with oil. I'm a messy painter, so painting with oil at times you just have to be careful. Uh, painting watercolor, you can basically wash out of your clothes, maybe some color, not so well. But um, I basically sort of joke that I have two sets of clothes, one that will have paint, that one that has paint, and one that will have paint. Uh, oil paint's a bit messy. If you have to transport it, you have to have it dry. Uh, painting out west, in the southwest. The paintings dry within a day or two and it's actually a problem painting with a palette knife. In that way painting with a brush when you're out in the southwest or in a very warm climate or dry climate, painting with a knife is problematic. Painting with a brush you can come back the next day, two days later, three days later. Painting with a knife you have a lot of texture so it becomes problematic. But uh, I love being able to push paint around, which you can do with oil paint. Uh, with watercolor, you can do a lot of dripping and splattering, but transporting them or showing them. Uh, nowadays, varnish is becoming more acceptable for watercolors. And in fact, I know, uh, I remember listening to Antonio Massi talking about hoping that the Watercolor Society will, in the not too distant future, accept watercolors that are not under glass, for now it's under glass. I don't want to deal with glass. Eventually, will I go to water-based oils? Very likely, just because the ease of transporting, because I do paint a lot in different parts of the country. Maybe we'll be going internationally as well. Uh, but I just love oil for now. I don't really have a painting that I'm most proud of. I have certain paintings that I really like. Uh, you'll find that painting, most of your paintings, you probably won't really like. Some you learn a lot of things from, maybe 30% you'll like, maybe 10% you'll really like. Uh, I was painting in Virginia and this beautiful scene in front of me and I was actually right near the back of my car. I had an easel set up near my car and there was another painter out in the field within speaking distance. And I turned to take a look where the other painter was and I'm working at this point, I think I was working on an 18 by 24 inch painting. I turned around to look at the other painter and the light, it was probably 6 or 7 in the morning, the morning light behind the other painter on the hill was unbelievable. I quickly ran, opened the trunk of my car, got into my car, I laid out three canvases. I mean, they're not canvas, they're boards. Uh, I think a 12 by 16 and two little tiny ones. And I just quickly turned around 
And one of my favorite paintings, actually both of the little ones sold, were these little tiny paintings that maybe had six strokes on them, but totally caught that light. Morning light, evening light, maybe you have uh, six to 10 minutes to capture that perfect light. And those little paintings, just, they were small. They were six by eight inch. They captured it. They turned out better than the 18 by 24 that I had been working on for an hour. And the 12 by 16 also sold. I mean, that was a good painting. But um, out in California this past winter, I was going up the coast. One of my favorite paintings, again, I did several that I liked because I don't often get to the Pacific coast in that gorgeous turquoise water. It's a treat for somebody who lives in landlocked states. Um, real treat. I did a small painting, once again, just a quickie because I'm dodging rain. And it's not that the colors are super, but the strokes just happened by magic. I do say there's a little bit of, I refer to it as magic. There are sometimes things happen. When you go and you want to paint the most perfect painting, forget it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, you don't always get that perfect painting. In fact, most rarely do you get it. So it's just this little bit of extra something that makes those paintings happen. It can be a momentary inspiration. Uh, I have several paintings I like. I have a large painting, um, 40, I think 40 by 60 that I'm working on in my studio. It doesn't look as good in the photo as it does in the painting. But I love it. It's uh, based on a bunch of trees and a scene that I had photographed. It's not a plein air painting. I had been driving, hoping to do more plein air paintings on this trip up uh, in Olympic Peninsula this past winter. And I didn't realize how large the peninsula was. You know, back east, you can drive anywhere within a short period of time. Uh, out west and the northwest, the drives are much longer. I didn't get to paint on site, but I took some photos and there was a scene I loved. I brought it back. I have that painting on my easel. I love that painting. I have another painting that many more people will ooh and all over because it's much more dramatic. It's another western scene. But the one I like is not necessarily the one everybody else likes. Uh, it just worked. So the paintings I like are some of those that just sort of painted themselves. Well, I hope you enjoyed Cynthia Rosen and her video about palette knife painting. You can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. She's really a rock star painter. I hope you're having a really good time learning and growing. I want you to stay safe, but keep your mind engaged and get better as an artist. What a great time to do that. Thanks for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes. Rembrandt and Francisco Goya did it. Henry Matisse and Marc Chagall did it. Now it's your turn to give it a whirl. What is it? Creating intense movement, depth, and color variation using a palette knife. It's an incredible tool that is a must-have for every artist. Yet many have not used the palette knife to paint directly on their canvas. And when they do, they're often surprised to see the unique interest and drama it creates in their artwork. Streamline Art Video proudly presents Expressive Landscape Painting, Palette Knife in Plain Air with master artist Cynthia Rosen. In this video presentation, you'll discover how your art can have a whole new look and feel by using a palette knife. And there's nobody better than Cynthia Rosen to show you the way to paint in this expressive, unique style that will produce eye-catching details in your work.
Blending her master's in education with her love of creativity and painting, Cynthia has been involved with education and the arts for most of her life. She's a full-time professional artist who easily communicates her focus on expression and her passion for color. From the moment Cynthia begins her start-to-finish paint demonstration, you'll be excited to grab your own palette knife and follow right along. As you enjoy the movement of the paint, you'll feel a whole new sense of freedom and excitement as you take up your newfound route to seeing, understanding, and reflecting the landscape like never before. You'll truly enjoy the tools and techniques that you're going to discover in this video. So though I'm applying colors all over the place, as I do, you can see that it's very deliberate. Every step I make, it's deliberate. She shows you how to see what's important to you in the scene, rather than struggle to figure out how to do everything correctly and according to the textbooks. Hi, I'm Cynthia Rosen. Thank you for joining me today. It's a beautiful day. I know the light's gonna change. There are lots of factors involved, but it's a different, non-traditional process, and I hope you take away something with you watching it. Her approach will let you enjoy your painting time and create happy memories. Those memories will become an integral part of the end product, part of the story, part of your story. Expressive Landscape Painting Palette Knife in Plain Air is available in both DVD and as a digital download. You'll definitely want to add this outstanding video to your resource library.